Yeah. Well, praise the Lord. Glad everybody's at church this morning. Glad you're here, that you made it out to the house of God. Have you enjoyed the weather, like you said? I, I know I have. My wife is still praying for snow, uh, so I don't know why. I was like, no more, and uh, I'm ready for spring. I'm ready, uh, uh, you know, to get out and watch the flowers grow and enjoy the weather. I'm glad you made it here in spite of the Super Bowl. You know, I really appreciate that. You know how many churches closed down on Sunday for the Super Bowl? My goodness. Uh, they closed down. Or I know uh, when we lived in Colorado, uh, my dad said, uh, this was back when I was younger, but he said uh, they, there was a church in Colorado Springs that they would shut down the service, but you could come and they would set up a big screen TV and watch the Super Bowl at church. And they would hand out popcorn and things like that. And uh, I couldn't believe that. I said, man, where's that church? And, uh, no. And uh, no, hey, man, I'm glad that you, uh, I'm glad that you uh, thought God was bigger, and bigger than a pigskin to be here this morning. And uh, I, I'm glad that you have made God a priority. Amen. When you get to heaven, God's not going to ask you about the Super Bowl and what the score was. He's going to ask you what you did in church. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to turn in our Bibles this morning. Oh, and I forgot, DJ, I was going to sing you a birthday song. Can I sing you a birthday song? This is my birthday song for you. I know it won't be sung to you, so I'm going to sing you your birthday song. You ready? This is your birthday song. It isn't very long. There you go. There's your birthday song, DJ. Happy birthday to you. Wanted you to t- wanted to tell you that. And uh, hopefully you'll remember that the rest of your life there. So praise the Lord. <laughs> Let's turn to our Bibles. Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32. And before we read and I have you stand, I'm going to tell you a, a, a quick story. Numbers chapter 32. I believe this is a subject that the Lord put on my heart that all of us have to just be reminded of. Numbers chapter 32, but I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story of a man that him and his wife, uh, they were not, ver- not married very long, and uh, he, he loved snakes. And I don't know if anybody's a snake lover here, but... Yeah. <laughs> Whew. God bless you. <laughs> no, not me. I'm not a snake lover. But he loved snakes, and uh, he'd always wanted a, uh, a python. I don't know if you know anything about pythons, but they get very, very large. And uh, this man always wanted a python, and so he went out, and uh, as a newly wed couple, he uh, talked his wife into letting him get a python and keeping it in the basement. So he kept the snake in the basement, and, the, and uh, over time the snake got bigger and bigger, and he would go down every day after work and mess with this snake and kind of have fun with it and and uh, as slowly he began to teach the snake tricks. He couldn't believe it, but the snake began to respond to him after on a daily basis going down there. And he, could, he taught the snake how to actually uh, unhook its cage and come out of the lid. And uh, after more time and more time, he, he taught the snake how to not only do that, but to crawl over to him and sit at his feet and then crawl back and get back in the cage. And then after more time, and, and years went on, that this, he, he taught the snake this, and he got it to where the this, this snake was uh, very large at the time, but it could get out of his cage, crawl over to him, crawl up his feet and surround him, and then put, his head on his, or put the snake's head on top of his head. And it's a true story. And then he would uncurl himself and go back to his cage. Well, this goes on for years at a time, and he brought some friends over, and they uh, couldn't believe this snake and what he had taught it, and they told other friends, and very quickly he became very famous for the tricks that he did, and he was actually asked to come and do shows and uh, with this you know, large python, and they just could not believe this, this man. So he began to do this and do shows and make money and travel and, and all of these things, and he was just very comfortable with this snake. And then one, uh, one day he was at a show doing the show and uh, he told everybody to be very quiet and he set the snake up like he always did 
and he did the call that he gave and the snake came out of its cage and thousands of people watching at this time. He gave the call, had the snake get out of its cage. The snake came and slithered across the floor as he always did. Went up and started at his feet, began to curl up around him, went all the way up, sat on top of his head. The crowd oohed and awed, just could not believe that this man and this snake responded to each other as such. And he gave the call for the snake to to get off and, and go back to his cage. But this time, the snake, for whatever reason, decided not to do it. And so the man gave the call again with a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, with a little more excitement trying to get the snake off of him, and the snake didn't do it. And uh, the crowd sat and watched as the snake began to slowly tighten, feeling the man being tense. The snake's natural instincts picked up on his on the tents in, the, in, in this man and began to tighten and he called out again to the snake to get off and before they knew it the crowd watched in front of them as the snake slowly uh, strangled this man and wrapped him so tight they could hear his bones break in his body and killed the man right there on stage. It's a sad story but a story of how getting comfortable with something can even though you know how dangerous that it can be, but sometimes we get so comfortable that we don't think of the danger that can come. Numbers chapter 32, we're going to read verse 23, if we'll all stand real quick for the reading of the Word of God. Numbers 32, verse 23, if you're able. Very common portion of Scripture, if you've been in church for any length of time, the Bible says, But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. Let's pray. Holy Spirit of God, we love you. Thanks for the day that you've given to us. Ask that you'd please, Holy Spirit, help me to say what you'd have me to say this morning. That I would say nothing more and nothing less. And just ask that you'd be with us and that you'd meet with us this morning in the service. We sure do love you. Thank you, Father, for everything that you've done. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to preach the word of God. I don't deserve to. And I feel, as, feel very unworthy. But I thank you, Father, for counting me worthy in putting me in the ministry, ask that you'd speak this morning. May our hearts be, a, uh, Lord, uh, may our, our hearts be warned this morning, and may we take to heed the word of God. We love you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I felt last night as I was preparing that the Holy Spirit wanted me to give a warning to the Christians today. Every Christian needs to be reminded and be warned again of the danger of sin. As this man was reminded, I'm sure, by his wife that the snake was dangerous and probably uh, told him how uncomfortable she was with it and he probably shrugged her to the side and said, it's, it'll be fine. So sometimes we in our lives, we uh, imagine sin as a toy that we can just take out and play with and then put it back whenever we want to. But sin is more of like a dictator, where when given the opportunity, it takes control. I'd like to put out a plea this morning to remind you that there is a danger, that there is danger ahead in a life of sin. There's a trap that the old devil puts out, and that, that, that sin is pleasurable for a season. But I want to remind you, like the snake, to stay away before it turns on you. You may think that you have a hold on sin. You may think that you've got this. You may think that you can break it whenever you want to. But can I remind you that sin will take control. There's a penalty. And there's a judgment to come. And I put out a warning because not only will sin take control of you now, but there is a penalty that sin brings. There is a judgment to come that sin brings in our lives. Can I warn you today to stay away from sin? In this world, sin is rampant. We see more and more that the Bible is true when it said that in the last days that it would get worse and worse and sin has become increasingly worse. And even in our fundamental Baptist churches where sin has become so prevalent, that it's become second nature to Christians. God says He's called us to holiness. 
not to a life of sin. Where does sin come from? Let me give you a, a, a verse real quick. James chapter 1, verse number 15. We know that sin started with Adam and Eve, and, but where did sin take its root? And where does sin develop in our lives? James chapter 1, verse 15, the Bible says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. The devil puts in front of you lust. Things that he knows that you desire. Things that he knows that you'll covet after. That you'll lust. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The devil puts these things in front of you. And when you take that and allow it to conceive, when you allow it to bring life, when you allow it to take root, the Bible says it brings forth sin. Each of us are made differently and made uniquely by an almighty God. But each of us also have different desires and different lusts that are unique to us. And the devil knows that. And the devil constantly puts in front of us those lusts, those desires, to see if we'll take it and let it conceive in ourselves and bring forth sin. Can I put a warning out today not to let that lust take root? Not to give in to the lust of the flesh. Not to give in to the lust of the eyes. Not to give in to the pride of life. And let sin be brought forth. Everyone in here is a sinner today. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody in this room is susceptible. Nobody is exempt from sin and its penalty. Everything that you do and every sin that you have, maybe, maybe you uh, don't do it in front of us. But every sin, public or private, is known by an almighty God. That's why he said, for all have sinned. Because God knows everybody's sin. God knows the pastor. God knows the president. God knows the deacon. God knows the church member. God knows everybody's life, public or private. And God sees the sin that we're involved in. And God says in, verse, in Numbers 32, 23, be sure that sin will find you out because God's already found out. Remember, you can't get away with sin. Remember that God will reveal it, that God will bring it to light. And that's why it's important to stay away from it. Remember that you may think it's hidden. You may think it's under the blanket. It's under the covers. But God will pull the covers back one day. You say, well, bro well, Brother Haley, what's the big deal? What's there to warn about sin? What's the big deal with my sin? I enjoy it. Well, let me give you some things today that I believe are important to, bring, to warn about sin. Number one, sin brings death. James chapter 1, verse number 15, the Bible says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Romans 6, 23, very famous portion of Scripture, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. Sin brings a penalty of death into our lives. Not just spiritual death. One day, those that are lost, that die without Christ, that have to pay for this penalty of sin, that Christ has paid for, but if you pay for it and assume that for yourself, the Bible says there will be an eternal death. Romans chapter 20, verse 13 through 15. I'll read it to you. Romans chapter 20, verse 13 through 15. The Bible says here about sin, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. When you die without Christ and you have to pay the penalty for sin, the eternal punishment is eternal damnation. A second death, the Bible says. The ultimate punishment for sin is the lake of fire. The ultimate condemnation that God puts on sin. Today, if you've not taken care of Sin, if you've not accepted Jesus as your Savior to pay for the sin that you know is in your life, to pay for this penalty, then you too will accept 
this condemnation that God will judge every man according to his works. But not only does sin bring death spiritually, sin brings death physically. We as Christians, we're saved. You're born again today. You've accepted Jesus as your Savior. You've escaped this eternal punishment. But sin can still bring death physically. Let me show that to you. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse number six, uh, 13. You say, what's the big deal about sin? 2 Samuel chapter 12. Let's ask a man in the Bible that didn't think there was a big deal. Verse 13. We're going, to, or we're going to actually start in verse 10. It says, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. David committed adultery. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly... But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David thought he could hide it. David thought he could pull it under the covers. But God said he saw it. Even though it was done in secret, God saw everything. Verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because of this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. David, uh, David is in heaven tonight, or today, I'm sorry. He's born again. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, but he's also sitting beside a child that died at birth because of his sin. Sin will bring death physically to your life. Sin will bring death sometimes to other people. Ask Abraham. He committed sin with Hagar. And now the Jews and the Arabs have been fighting and killing ever since. Ask Judas who jumped off a cliff because his sin drove him to commit suicide. Ask Aaron the priest when he sinned and God took his life on top of the mountain. Sin will bring death physically. God may not take your life as he did to some of the Bible. God may take the life of others. God may bring death maybe just to incidences in your life. Maybe God will bring death or bring to a stop things in your life. Maybe God will put on hold. I don't know what God will do, but I warn you that sin does bring death. Something dies because of sin. Don't let sin bring, don't let sin bring death, bring a stop to your relationship with God. When we sin and we know it, the Bible says that, like what David says, that he sinned against the Lord, and when he, he says, God will not hear me because of my sin. Sin can bring a temporary death to your relationship with the Lord until you get it right, get it fixed. Whatever the case, sin ultimately will bring death to something. Stay away from it. Can I warn you today? Don't let sin become an option. Don't let sin become an idea at your work. Don't let sin become an idea in your family. Put it out of your mind. Stay away from it. Put a warning sign out that you'll stay away from that edge. Sin brings death physically. It brings death spiritually. And I ask you today, if you're not saved, make sure you take care of that sin. Make sure that you ask Jesus to pay for that. Don't assume the penalty on yourself. Ask Pontius Pilate. His sin brought the death of our Savior. Felix the governor brought death to himself physically and spiritually. Both of those men are in hell tonight because of sin. They wanted to please themselves. They wanted what they wanted. They didn't want to humble themselves to the Savior. Sin brings death. Number two, sin is deceitful. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 13. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 13. Read this to you. The Bible says here, I 
can get to Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. Can I show you a man who avoided the deceitfulness of sin? Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 25. Well, verse 24, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses recognized the deceitfulness that sin tries to portray. Sin tries to look pleasurable. Sin tries to look like it's okay, like that it sounds good or seems fun. But sin is a death trap. Sin puts out a, a mask and it holds on itself a mask of deceitfulness, a mask of pleasure, but really it's full of discontentment and destruction when it's come. Sin is deceitful. Moses found that out. Moses recognized it and said, I'd rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the sin in Pharaoh's house because he knew the pleasure of sin is only for a season. Sin's pleasure only lasts so long before it brings death. Sin is deceitful, trying to mask itself in your life to think it'll be okay, that it won't last, that you can break it, that it'll be fun, that it'll be okay, that you'll be, you'll be fine in doing it, nobody will find out, and it constantly tells you lies to cover its deceitfulness. Sin is like a lure that makes you think it is something that it's not. When you, when you bite down on the lure, it's too late. It's hooked you. You may think you can get away with one look, sir, at that bad picture. You may think you can get away with that look at the bad magazine. You may think you can get away with one drink or one smoke or one drug, one night away. Maybe you think you can get away and think that it'll be fine. My wife will never know. God will never know. The pastor will never know. But sin is deceitful. I'm here to warn you to stay away. You may not be involved in sin today and thank God. But if you are, then thank God that you're not involved in sin and ask God to keep you away and that you'd see the deceitfulness of sin. Boy, sin is deceitful. It's like a trap that's hidden underneath and camouflaged so that you don't recognize it. Because sin does not want you to recognize it in your life. Sin does not want you to see the, de the damage and the destruction that it brings. So it looks like a pottage, the, or it looks like the, the, the porridge, or, or the pot that, uh, of beans that, uh, that Jacob gave to Esau because he was hungry at the time, and it seemed like it was okay, but it turns around and takes everything that you have. Sin wants everything. Like I, sin, like I said, sin is like a, a dictator that acts like it will benefit you, but it wants to take control. Be careful of the deceitfulness of sin. Don't be fooled by sin. Don't let sin lie to you. Don't let the devil lie to you and make you think that it's okay. He did that to Eve. He made Eve think that it wasn't as bad as she thought it was. That it wouldn't do what, she, what God said it would do. That it would do something different. And the devil lied and the deceitfulness of sin was started at the very beginning. And now we're here today because sin is deceitful. Number three, sin is demanding. Romans chapter 6, verse number 16. Sin is demanding. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Sin is demanding. It wants a servant. It doesn't want to be controlled. It wants to control. Sin does not want a subject. Sin wants to be the master. Sin doesn't want to be overtaken. It wants to, or sin wants to overtake, not be overtaken. Sin wants to not be contained, but to rule. Sin demands service. That's why it said you'll be a servant to sin. You'll serve sin. You think, well, I'm the man. I control my own life. Or I can take care of it. 
or I can break it. Sometimes we think that we have it taken care of and we're fooled by sin and not realize that sin makes us a servant. What are we servants to? Ser servants unto death. Sin brings death. Verse 17, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. If you've been born again, you've been made free from sin, but you still have to make a daily choice not to submit yourself as a servant to sin. If you're lost today, you don't have a choice. If you're lost today, you don't have a choice in who you serve. You serve sin. That's it. You'll obey the lusts thereof because you're of your father, the devil. And the Bible says that sin reigns in your mortal body. You don't have a choice. You serve sin no matter what. But if you're born again, you have a choice to be free from sin and not give in to deceitfulness. But sin demands a servant. Sin demands servants. Are you a servant to sin today? Are you bound? Well, God can help you get it taken care of. God can make you free either through salvation or through a repentant heart that comes to God and, it, and realizes the sin that you've been a servant to. Number four, sin is deterring. Sin is deterring. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse number 1, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. God has a race He wants you to run. God has a will for your life He wants you to, to do. God has something, a work, that He wants you to fulfill for your life. But if you let sin become a habit, it will detour you from what God has. It says, sin which doth so easily beset us. Notice that word, easily. God says, it's easy for us to be beset by sin. It's easy for us to fall out of the race and sit on the sideline because we become involved in sin, and sin will beset you. Sin will cause you to stay sitting and not run for God. But God wants us to run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Sin wants to take our eyes off Jesus Christ and take our eyes off what's important and put our eyes on, on ourselves, put our eyes on the sin that we become easily beset by. But God wants you to look at Jesus, look to Jesus today and run that race. He's the author, the finisher of our faith. And, we want, and God wants us to serve, serve Him. Sin wants you to take, away, take you away from God. Sin never brings you closer to God. Sin never allows you to have a better relationship with God. Sin takes you farther and farther and farther away, farther than you wanted to go, and keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. Sin doesn't want God's will for your life. Sin wants you to be a servant to His will. Sin is calling to you today. Makes you think that it's okay. Puts a lie to you that it won't take you and won't overtake you and won't control your life. But really it wants to be the dictator and push God out of the throne. Sin will take you down a different road than what God intends for you to travel. If you don't believe me, ask Jonah. Jonah gave in to sin of pride. God told Jonah where he wanted him to go. And Jonah fled from the will of God. And Jonah went down to Tarshish. And God had to use a whale to get him to realize the sin that he had done in turning from God. It took, sin took him down a different road. And sin would have brought death to Jonah had Jonah not got it right. God would have left Jonah in the bottom of the ocean in the belly of a whale. But Jonah got it right. And God delivered him. Because sin is, with, is not without judgment. Have you been deceived by sin? Sin is deterring. It doesn't want you to fulfill God's will for your life. 
Young person, God's got a will for you. God loves you. Don't be entrapped by sin. Verse number 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Notice that, that we're to consider Jesus. He endured the contradiction of sinners. When you become involved by sin, and you allow sin to reign, you begin to contradict. Jesus Christ. You, beca- you begin to become, the Bible says, enmity with God. Sin is God's enemy. Sin is everything that God is against. And when we allow sin to reign, we begin to become contradicting to God Himself. Jesus endured that contradiction because He loves us. And He died for us and gave His life. But when we give in to sin... We crucify afresh the Lord Jesus. Sin will contradict God in your life and contradict everything that God wants to do. That's why when somebody's involved in sin, they go opposite of the Word of God. They go to church less. They spend time with God less. They dress like what God wants them to dress like less. They have the attitude that God wants them to have less because sin will contradict the Word of God in your life. When you become involved in sin, you notice how you always go backwards, never forward. You always go back to where you came from, not forward to where God wants you. Because remember verse 6, Hebrews 12, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. God can't let you get away with sin as his son. It'll deter you, it'll take you off track, and God will have to chasten you because God loves you, and he knows where sin will take you. Allow God to chasten you and bring you back to him. Like I said, you may not be involved in sin today, but if you aren't, thank the Lord. But put up that warning sign back in your life and don't allow yourself to step too close. Don't allow that snake to become comfortable. Don't allow yourself to be okay with sin. In our lives, we become okay with sin. Don't be okay with the sin around you. Don't be okay with how the ladies are at work. Don't be okay with how the people act in public. Don't be okay with allowing your kids to see things on television. Don't be okay with allowing sin into your home and be comfortable with that snake and let it be deceitful and think, well, we can watch it and it not affect us. Don't be okay with sin. Because sin wants to rule. It wants to take control. And it may not take control of you, but it'll take control of somebody. We as parents, we as men must take the lead and not allow sin to have any influence. Because sin will bring these four things into either our lives or the lives of our family. Don't allow that sin to become a part of you. Because remember, we go back to our text verse, be sure your sin will find you out. Make this a verse you commit to memory. Make it a verse that you memorize. Put it down on a 3 by 5 card. And when you go, take it with you. Remind yourself that sin has a penalty. Sin will be found out. You won't be like David and be able to hide it. You won't be like David and try to sweep it under the covers and not know that God will bring it to light. Every one of us in our lives must put up that sign again. We must put up those rails so that we stay away from the edge of sin lest we fall. But remember like David, can I encourage you today, if you're involved in sin, 2 Samuel where we read, you can read that again, but the Bible says that David said, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said that God had already forgiven him. There's forgiveness, amen. 
1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Thank the Lord that God is loving and that He'll cleanse us and forgive us for where we fail. But we have to be willing to come to Him and recognize that and tell God, I've sinned, God. I've sinned against the Lord. Let God get it right in our lives. But don't just tell it to God. Go back with a desire and a fervency not to let yourself get involved in that again. Are you in sin today at all? Or have you allowed sin maybe to become a thought? Put up that sign again. Put up that warning. Remind yourself that sin is, brings death. That sin will be found out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we sure do love you.